And welcome back. And in this next segment, we're going to talk about worship in the hybrid church. And what's remarkable is that since, since the beginning of the pandemic, the ways that we have gathered and the ways that we have thought of worship have shifted dramatically. And prior to the pandemic, significantly less than 10% of the congregations in the ELCA actually offered online worship in any form. And oftentimes when, it, when the issue was brought up, folks would say, well, we don't need to. Or we would say our focus is on the people who are here. And the other thing that I noticed was that as we lived into this, I, I will add, I've learned a lot in the past seven months about this. this. This has been a wonderful learning curve for me and a learning curve for so many of us. And at this point, it's somewhere in the 60% range for ELC congregations. Two-thirds of, of church worship is now, the congregations are having online, about a third roughly aren't. And that's not a judgment. Some can't, um, some made other choices, etc. But right now, about a third of congregations are not online for worship and about two-thirds are. That's right, Richard. Yeah, and the other part of it is the ways in which we worship online have shifted as well, because prior to the pandemic, we had congregations that would broadcast a live stream of their in-person worship, but it was basically a broadcast of a worship service, and it was not specifically an online service designed right. really, specifically. It was more for people who were homebound or couldn't come. And because actually it's not very good TV uh, by itself. So probably it wasn't so much an outreach, although people may have considered it that, but it was really more for people who couldn't be there, especially um, older people who had access to internet but couldn't come to worship so they could see and participate that way. And, I, and I had, I've had at least a few young adults over the recent months saying, it is not exciting to watch other people commune. And I would say I'm not a young adult, and it's not exciting to watch other people commute. Right, and that's why I think this uh, information, Carrie Newhoff, who's one of the kind of consultants who's been following and working hard on this, said this last week on an engagement seminar that he had online. He said a lot of people used to use online to, to get people to come to the building. In other words, it was an attraction thing. But in the future, pastors will use the building to reach people online. In other words, the target the audience the action will be focused on people not coming to church but actually church coming to people and that whatever you do um, needs to be accessible to unchurched people out in the in the world um, prior to the pandemic as uh, excited as we were about the people who came to our congregations only about 12 to 14 percent of americans come to church in any given week prior to the pandemic and the estimates are that number will be cut in half after the pandemic, that your worship attendance will be closer to 50% of what it was. That's post-pandemic at, at its recovery point that we're going to lose a lot of people. So whatever you do, Zoom, Facebook, Live, whatever, if you're doing it and it isn't really thinking about the people out there as, as an actual group of people that they can't find you, they can't access you, you're not thinking about them in terms of the work you're doing, you're probably doing it wrong. And one of the things that I would add is sometimes in the past, when we thought of how we would have used online, it was sort of like having a funnel that you would you know, try to get people to come through the funnel to come into the building. And it was almost um, a, a narrowing. Right. And in some ways, the, what's happened is we've shifted our vision rather than bringing people into the building, we are taking the, you know, we are taking the building, we're taking the ministry into the world and it's almost a recapturing of the vision of, let's say, the book of Acts, where all the best stories are on the road. Right, which is Rarely why things like this are so important, Richard. Like, this is, a, this is a congregation that I know fairly well, not mine. Um, I've covered the faces of people. I'm not here to shame anybody. But this is what you see for an hour and five minutes every week in this congregation. Camera doesn't move. Stationary. You can see it's actually a fairly good image. Uh, the people stand at those two music stands or sit at the chairs, depending on what they're doing, the entire hour. Um, they do online communion in this congregation. I'm not going to say whether that's a good or a bad thing. It's just true. You can make your own mind up on that issue. But they go and they move um, from behind the music stand to behind the altar, and the camera never moves. There's not a close-up. There's not anything. And so think about what people are watching. And while it might work to keep your members you know, the members of this congregation watch, they stay engaged because they love the church and they're glad something's coming to them. If you were a new person and just scanning through the internet, would you stay and watch this basically still life picture for an hour and five minutes while they do a bunch of stuff that's 
frankly, from a spectator perspective, not very interesting. Uh, on the ground worship is not designed for online viewing. And that's a visual thing and it's a liturgical thing. Um, watching church is boring. Um, and be honest, you, if you were to talk to some of the people in your congregation, being in church for some people is already boring when we were physically there. And I can take credit for boring so many people over the years. So I, I understand that. Um, but you have to rethink the whole thing. You have to spend time thinking, what are they seeing? What are they doing? What are they hearing? What are they experiencing? And it has to be shorter, crisper. It just has to be different. That means we have to adjust our liturgy. Um, what used to be good song leadership and one thing is really bad karaoke when you're just listening to the song leaders per perform on, on what would be basically a TV thing. So are, you, are your music things that you're using, is it good song leadership or are people not really, and it's just bad karaoke. Preaching, you know, when I used to tell a joke, I could tell if it bombed. If I told a sad story, I could tell if people's eyes watered up. Um, on, online, I can't, the interaction is different. So you have to reimagine interaction and rethink what it means to preach. Um, we're going to start recording worship differently, so I'm going to need to have my Sunday sermon recorded by Thursday. Um, but we're, if we ever come back to live, I'll be giving the same text sermon on Sunday. My mind works that sometimes the day of, I find the last piece of my sermon. It's like a spiritual rhythm for a week for me. What does it mean for me to start preaching next Wednesday's sermon this Wednesday while keeping this sermon for Sunday going till Sunday? Um, I haven't had to deal with two sermon overlaps, but if I'm recording. So all the adjustments we have to make are incredible. And don't assume that the liturgy that worked when people were there works the same online. Almost everybody agrees responsive readings online are a catastrophe, even though responsive reading might be um, a beautiful thing um, in, in person when people are actually physically together. So you have to really online rethink everything. And it might be a blessing um, because you can say, okay, what does it mean to gather people here? What does it mean to hear the word and preach it here? What does it mean to share in table if you're working on some kind of an online um, experience of the Eucharist? What does it mean to send people forth in mission in the world? Those four basic elements. The liturgy can still be the liturgy, but how do you do it differently? And it might be a blessing because maybe you'll think of things that are better to do in person. Um, as well. We can't sing right now because of the pandemic. If we were to come back, we wouldn't sing. And uh, we're still not physically in our building. We only have online. How do you do all those things? And what do you learn by being online? It says, you know, I could make worship more engaging in the physical gathered space as well from what I learned from how to engage people online. So just think about those engagement things and how you do that. And there's different ways to do that and put that together. And one of the conversations we sometimes have um, is what's the best way? to go online. And, and there's advantages to, you know, each of these two. And I, I might also just name something else as well, but the live streaming, it's, it, it happens live. And I, I will add, I like the energy you have with that when you're live and it's happening in real time. We're experiencing it together. But I will add another option is the uh, synchronous release viewing. And the beauty of that is we record it ahead of time, but we watch it together. And the, the piece in either of these though, is that you need to have the space where people can chat, where they can comment, where they can interact. And I think it's really important that congregations have people who are either uh, staff or you know either paid or um, unpaid staff, but people who are committed to interacting with worshipers, who are creating space to help cultivate community. And I've, I've seen folks who do this so very well, the way they create community. No, that's right, Richard, that if you can't engage people, remember, no matter what quality you're putting together, in most cases, if you're honest and just watch it, like comparing yourself to a reasonably well-produced TV pro program, in most cases, all of us are producing subpar TV. So it doesn't mean it's bad because it's about something else, but it's going to be about relationships and engagement. Because if you're trying to compete with the kinds of things that you see in well-produced television stuff, most of us just don't have the staff or the time or the resources to produce it at that quality. At the same time, most of us do have the staff and the learning curve to continually improve the quality we are producing and to also develop energy on relationships. And I would say you should keep improving the quality of your work, but really work on those relationships. So I'm gonna start with quality first. 
um, you got to spend some time and money. You know, um, our congregation and our council um, just Monday night spent uh, about $6,800 on technology and social media pieces, pulled money out of a, a, a piece that we had from somebody who gave some money for something. We took some money out of the memorial funds to do some things. You know, you got to kind of rob Peter to pay Paul and kind of do things. But the reality is you do have to spend some money. Um, that the iPhone that you took and used for that first broadcast um, to get things up by Easter may not be the permanent solution. If you're going to have good online work, you can invest in um, different kinds of uh, pan zoom tilt con con um, Vivo cameras, whatever else kinds of things you're going to be doing, um, thinking about software and all those kinds of things. Because remember, while you're producing whatever you're producing so that people can worship together online, people do have choices. And we now know from some surveys that about 25% of all people who attend most congregations actually watch worship on some congregations other than the one that they attend. They might still watch yours. But 25% are watching and looking at other congregations online stuff. And there's some really good quality. If you were to go to Shepherd of the Valley in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and look at SOTV.org and look at what they produce each week, big congregation, five rostered leaders, technical people on staff, all that. Um, it's an excellently well-produced, liturgically framed service properly and well done from a technology standpoint. And if people could say, well, I'm just going to watch the best one that they're, they're, you know, eventually they're going to gravitate to 10 to 20 Lutheran services around the country and the rest of us are all going to be second fiddle, but, but you do have to produce good quality and you do have to put things together so you can engage people because relationships, not everybody can have a relationship with every place. Ministry is about people, not about technology. So I would urge you to start watching. My wife and I, every week, we, we do a live stream right now. So our worship is live um, online. We don't have a gathered worship physically, but only we gather online. But we come home, we make a sandwich, and we sit down and we scan through two or three um, worship services, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, United Church of Christ, non-denominational, big churches, little congregations, um, city places, country places. We just kind of scan around and look for stuff. And, um, you know, Richard, you said briefly about how your daughter watches worship. Could you just give us a 10-second snippet of how your daughter watches worship? It's really helpful for people. Yeah, and my daughter has shared that when she watches worship, she especially pays attention to the music. She's a musician. And she listens to the sermon. And she also adds that she's at home. So she says, I do the readings myself. I can do the prayers myself. And so... One of the things we may want to think about is as we prepare our worship, we may want to prepare it with the reality, with the awareness that people watch it differently. So maybe we want to give people tools yep. to, to be able to worship in their home and use some of the pieces we provide to enhance that. really helpful. The other thing I watch for, especially when I'm, because I'm trying to figure out, remember, if you're trying to create a, an environment for worship, um, segues are really important. Um, whether you edit them. So I actually watch how people do transitions and the aesthetics of places. Some places just look like cluttered catastrophes out of 1863 um, and other places look really crisp and together. So I look at worship environments and I've changed my own because I watched something and it was bad and I thought, but ours isn't much better. So we had to change some things. Um, our segues and transitions, how do they do it? Oh, that's better than ours when we've learned how to do things. So go on and learn, be curious and see what you can find out. The other thing is pay attention. You know, not only do you pay attention, but are, are other people paying attention? You can get good stats from Facebook or YouTube. You can get Google Analytics on your website and you should have those. I'd urge you to take the free Google Analytics tools and put them on for sure. And I'd urge you probably to spend the money to upgrade to at least the next level um, in whatever Google Analytics apps you're using. Start watching screen views and use the longest one, like Facebook tracks three second screen views. That means the screen went active while somebody scrolled by. No, if it's not a minute screen view, just assume that either you are so bad they didn't stay or they were scrolling through and don't blame yourself. But watch how long they watch. You know, you might have a hundred screen views and the average screen view when they average it all out is one minute and one second. Whoa, it was a 43 minute service. What's the deal? Well, 80 people watched a chunk of it. 40 people watched a smaller chunk of it and all those three second views get averaged in and they kill you. So watch those things. Um, look at the trends. Are people staying online longer? Are more people watching now than watched at Easter? Um, most of us, to be honest, are estimating too high. 
Uh, the real attendance numbers are probably smaller. So use that longest screen view and uh, a multiplier that's not real big. Um, and really it doesn't matter what your multiplier is. The real question is, are the number of screen views this week higher or lower than they were three months ago or the next three months? So you can tell if you're engaging people and connecting people in, or if you're starting over time to lose people and weaning people out. And I think that's really key. And one thing I would just add by way of advice, don't compare yourself to other churches. Don't say they're getting 300 views. We're getting 100 views. What's wrong with us? This is really just about learning about your own views. Right. And I think and it's how like you engage. Bowling. I think of it as golf and bowling. You know, when I golf, I am I'm kind of a bogey golfer. So for me, if I shoot a typical round would be a 90. If I shoot an 86, I had a great day, even if the guy I golfed with had an 81. And if I had a 96, I had a so-so day, even if the guy I golfed with had 103. Um, depend because it depends who you're golfing. You really, these are things about yourself. And just look at the trend. Don't compare yourself to the biggest church or the fanciest church or the. Just look at yourself and say, where are we? And where are we moving? What's happening to us? Are we maturing? Are we growing? Are we engaging? And it's this making making progress in the right direction. Remembering that the longest journey begins with a single step. The other thing is just watch um, passive engagement. If you're doing Facebook Live, for example, how many people like, how many people love, all those kinds of things. But try to move towards active engagement. Try to get people engaging um, in comments and, and really watch, are people sharing? Because a like is, is nice. It kind of strokes your, your ego. But a share means it actually moved out. And you want all of these numbers to be moving up over time. One of the things you can do, and Richard alluded to this already, uh, this is a clip from our children's sermon last week. My wife was talking. She was teaching a table prayer as part of that. And over here, here's somebody um, responding to something that was said in it. One of my biggest problems is when I want something to happen, I want it now. I don't want to wait. And then we have a staff person on the line. Her name's Allison. You're not alone. Lots of us have that issue. So in real time, something happens and these kind of comments come out. Just try to foster conversations, engage people. When somebody comes on and says, I'm here, say hello, Ellie, or whatever those things are. The real key isn't, are you putting on TV? The real key is, is worship happening in a way that's creating community and connecting people with God and with each other. And the way that you need to do that is not by people watching, but by people interacting. And you can control a lot of that interaction by being there to interact. It's one of the beautiful things about um, the synchronous viewing is if you're the pastor who preached that Sunday, you can preach on, on Thursday, get it in and have it all recorded and set up. And at 9.30 or 10, it gets released. Everybody watches it. You can actually be online with people as they watch your sermon. And you can make snide comments about your own sermon. I, I, that was a tough spot there, wasn't it? Or, you know, as I thought about this after giving it, I wondered this, and you can ask a question. What do you all think? And then get people to follow up um, with their own answers and things. So be, be conscious that there's some real advantages to, to synchronous viewing of a recorded thing. If the staff who are in worship will also be online when it's broadcast, you can now go from being a presenter to an engaging part participant, which is really what you were when you were the liturgical leader, I hope, on the physical kind of gathering before. So the last thing I want to say is, remember this engagement is a key to finding new people. Um, speak to visitors online. So say things routinely, like if you're worshiping online with us for the first time, we're so glad you're here. Um, one congregation that I've been watching and, and things has contact cards on their website and a clear connection with the link on their um, broadcast when they stream. And they say, we'll make a food bank. Every new contact that comes in every Sunday, we make a $5 donation to our new food bank. So if we get 10 new contact cards, we're going to send 50 bucks to the food pantry. And every week they do this. And so there's an incentive for you to sign up because somebody benefits besides even the ministry. The other thing, ask them questions. If you can ask a question and somebody comments, then their name's there. So suppose Jane Doe is watching and doesn't do anything. If you can get Jane Doe to like it, then you can go down your Facebook thing and see all the people who liked it and you go, gee, I don't know who Jane Doe is. Now you can, you can interact with Jane Doe because she's identified herself as, as being there. So use polls, information gathering questions. I'm getting ready to start a new series of events, like one-time educational things online. And I'm going to ask people, okay, we're going to do six one-night events on six different topics. What would you like us to talk about? And I'm going to hope that people say um, education, politics, environment, um, spirituality, prayer, whatever those things are. But when they do it, their name comes out. Now I can interact with them. I could even go and do other things. So that's what we've got on this section, Richard. Um, you want to kind of 
lead us into the, the kind of pause moment here? Yeah, and as we, and I, and again, to give you, you know, take a few moments, catch your breath. And again, what were the things in this time period that made you say, aha, what would you like to know more about? What were the things that could have been challenging? Um, I will add, we all have been humbled in this season and it's okay. And then most of all though, what would be a place where you might wanna try something new where you are? And uh, again, invite, we invite you to write some notes, bring some questions. And also in weeks to come, you know, feel free to call on us because we're learning together and we're happy to help you continue to learn as we move through this. So I'd say, let's take a breather. And in this time also, please be blessed.